Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for the opportunity. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be up here this morning. And uh, I know, Lord, that it's your will that I be here. You have put me here, Lord, for a reason. And I pray that my words, Father, are pleasing to your ears. And uh, I pray that um, they touch others. And so, Father, I just pray that you just give me the, the strength and the peace to be here and to speak the words that you've given me. I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Gary Rorson, and uh, I am one of the elders here at CMA Church. have been an elder now for, I guess, maybe a little bit less than two years. And Pastor Will asked me recently if I'd be willing to be part of the sermon series on prayer. And specifically, he asked me if I'd be part of, uh, be willing to share with you about my private prayer life, what it means to me, how I approach it, and what it looks like in my life today. I give a testimony, I guess, so to speak, about what personal or private prayer means in my life. Now, recently, it was about three or four weeks ago, maybe a little longer, Pastor Roy gave a message, and in that message, he mentioned that he would probably prefer to be up here preaching on a Sunday rather than being in the nursery changing diapers. Quite frankly, I'd probably be more comfortable in the nursery changing diapers right now than I am standing up here. I uh, thought about that last night when I was changing my granddaughter's diaper. <laughs> so, this is not my comfort zone, standing up here, but I do believe God's given me a message. He's given me a testimony to share on this subject. So, let me start. Now, I've been a believer and a follower of Jesus for pretty nearly my entire adult life. I gave my life to Christ in 1980, shortly after I moved to Morgantown from Long Island, New York. I am one of those people who have moved from New York to West Virginia. There's probably not a lot of us. Uh, my, wife and Shirley, my wife Shirley and I, we attended a small church here in Morgantown for about 16 years before we started attending here at CMA in 1996. So I've attended here a long time and I've been a Christian for a long time. In all those years, I've participated in many of the things that you might do as a believer. I've attended and taught Bible studies. I've served many, in many capacities here in the church, trustee, administrative board, uh, taught boys and boys brigade on Wednesday nights, on camping trips and canoe trips and with the boys, so on and so on. So I've worn a lot of different hats in my service to the Lord. Now here's where I need to confess though that in all my years as a believer, my personal private prayer life has just not been one of my strong points. My time alone with the Lord has often been too short or too shallow Quite honestly, at times, pretty non-existent. I just did not give prayer a lot of time in my life. Oh, sure, when some crisis arose or when there was some great need in my life, I would go to God and I would ask him for answers or seek his will. But of course, I'd pray for others when they asked me to and they had needs. But as far as my everyday life was concerned, quite frankly, I just didn't give my individual prayer life, the time that I know I should have. I didn't place enough value on my prayer life to give God my undivided attention like I knew I should have. My prayer life was at best weak. Consequently, my relationship with him suffered because of it. My relationship with him didn't grow beyond where it was, and my spiritual growth pretty well stopped then as well just kind of reached a point and I kind of stayed there. Now, hopefully your private prayer life is rock solid and you're not like I was. This room is full of people I know who have faithful, dedicated prayer lives, people I've looked up to for many, many years. And I hope that's the case and I'm just preaching to the choir here. We don't have a choir, but we have a praise team. But it, I honestly believe the Lord has impressed on me that there are Make, might be a few other people in this room 
who might find themselves today like I used to be. So therefore, let me attempt to explain what changed in my spiritual life, and particularly in my personal prayer life. So back in 2017, I went through a pretty rough season in my life. At this point, I, like I said, I really wasn't devoting myself to, uh, honestly, a consistent study of the word, and I wasn't cons uh, being consistent in my prayer life either. On the surface, everything looked fine. But there were things going on in my life that were causing me to have a lot of anxiety. Um, my dad had passed away in 2010. My mom had passed away in 2016. Of course, they lived in New York. I was the executor of their estates. So I was burdened with a lot of the affairs of getting the estate settled, particularly my mom's. And when my mom passed away, I found out that my dad's estate hadn't been finished. So I had to kind of complete them both. And then there were a bunch of tax issues that went along with that. My mom had had her identity stolen in the meantime and different things. So anyway, these things were really becoming a burden to me. And I was having a very, very severe case of anxiety. Um, I had a bad case. That these, this stuff wasn't really a problem, but it was a problem to me. And so I had a really bad case of the what ifs, if you've ever been there. Worry and fear had just a tremendous grip on me that at one point it got so bad that I didn't sleep for five days. Now, if you've ever gone through five days with absolutely no sleep, you might be able to relate to that. But I, it was hard. And I'd convinced myself I was fighting a spiritual battle with Satan. In the midst of this, I was praying. I was studying God's word. But to be honest, looking back on it now, I was just asking God to fix my problems. I had a tendency to give my anxiety and worry to God, and then I'd let it creep back into my head. In other words, even though I would follow what scripture told me, that I should pray and give all my cares and worries to God, as, as Peter tells us, eventually, I, t I just unintentionally take them back. So finally, I swallowed my pride, and I started counseling sessions with Pastor Will. He listened to me, shared scripture with me, and he prayed with me. And finally, he looked at me one night and he said, you don't suppose God's trying to get your attention, do you? Well, those words cut through me like a knife because it was exactly what I needed to hear, but it wasn't what I wanted to hear. I was totally convicted by his words. I knew I hadn't been obedient to God in studying his word or in being in prayer. Will was right. God was indeed trying to get my attention. So what did I do? How did I respond to the Lord? Well, there was no doubt in my mind that God was indeed trying to get my attention. I had to humble myself, confess my disobedience to him, and I rededicated myself to getting back to daily time in God's word and daily meaningful time in prayer. One thing I knew I had to do was change the way I spent time praying. I knew I had to be disciplined to be consistent. So I went to the word and I looked at what Jesus taught us about prayer. In Matthew chapter six, he tells us, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. So I literally began taking the time in the morning before I left the house for work to go to my bedroom, close the door behind me, and get on my knees and pray. And I found that it was in those times that I felt the closest to the Lord. It became my time to slow down, my time to speak to him and listen to him. It became my time to... To, to offer my praise and thanksgiving for his being my great God and Father in heaven, to tell him my deepest thoughts and concerns and to thank him for all he's done for me, to offer him my prayers for my family and others 
And when I would pray, it set me on the right path for my day. It put me in the right mindset before I went out into the world. And when circumstances would sometimes keep me from my normal prayer routine, I would find another way to make it happen. My daily prayer time, along with my daily time in God's word, became the most important time of my day. And consequently, a new season of spiritual growth began in my life. My relationship with God from that point began to develop and grow again. So now, that's 2017. Fast forward with me a couple years to 2020. And I shouldn't have to remind you what happened in 2020, right? That was the year of COVID. The year the, year pan, year the pandemic started. Well, in December of 2020, Shirley was diagnosed with breast cancer. And if you haven't been there, most of you should know, cancer just rocks your world. I mean, and breast cancer treatment is really, really hard and long. But Shirley's the toughest person I know. And she managed that treatment amazingly well. And she has such an amazing faith. She told me two things right from the start. She said, don't worry, God's got this. And... She also told me, it's a good thing it's me and not you. (laughs) Because nobody knows me better than Shirley does, other than the God. Now, I watched her use her cancer as an opportunity to witness to others about her faith. And I watched God hold her up through the treatments and the surgeries to bring her the miracle of healing and freedom from cancer that she has today. As for me... The message he sent me in 2017 and the subsequent change in my spiritual life had prepared me for the challenges and the difficulties of walking with her through her cancer journey. Little did I know that his getting my attention back then was to prepare me for the storm that was coming in 2020. But I like to think I was ready. During that time, I spent more time in God's word and more time on my knees praying than I ever had before. I leaned heavy into Paul's words in Philippians where he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So even though I found myself alone praying for Shirley with tears running down my cheeks many, many mornings, fear and worry no longer gripped me like it had before. I like to think that I had grown in my faith and my walk with the Lord sufficiently to the point that I could simply pray and trust him and then be at peace with the difficult circumstances we were in. It was an incredibly difficult time for Shirley But fortunately, finally, I like to think she had the godly man behind her that she needed to support her through her cancer journey. And praise God for his answers to my prayers and the prayers of many of you. She's cancer free today. So since then, my personal private prayer life has continued to grow and develop as my relationship with the Lord grows deeper. For the most part, I still stick with my discipline of going to my room alone, closing the door behind me and praying first thing in the morning because I've learned that this is what works best for me to stay disciplined. But I also find myself praying a lot more at other times of the day now as well. Some days I feel like my whole day is filled with prayers as the Holy Spirit guides me through my day. Now I realize that what works for me may not work for everyone else the same way. I mean, a mom with small kids In the house, she can't lock herself in her bedroom. She might want to, but she can't. (laughs) Students might not have the space in a dorm or an apartment to be able to go lock themselves away for a while. Many of you know David Gooden. He was the pastor here for many years. Um, When a friend of mine shared an article with me recently that Pastor David wrote in the Alliance Life magazine in 2015, 
And in that article, David shared about his prayer life and how getting a hot tub gave him a new place to spend time in prayer. He actually called it his prayer tub in the article. I don't have a prayer tub, but I can certainly relate to the need to have my own space to pray alone. We see in the Gospels that Jesus lived his life in constant communion with the Father. We see how important time alone in prayer with the Father was to him. Time and again, we read how Jesus went off alone, a lot of times up on a mountain, or to some deserted place to pray. Some of those times we see that are in the first chapter of Mark, before he, just right before he travels to preach. In Luke chapter six, 12, verses 12 through 16, right before he chooses the 12 disciples from among his followers. Matthew chapter 14, before he fe- right before he feeds the 5,000. Matthew 14 again, before he walks on water. And Matthew 26, when he prays at Gethsemane before his crucifixion. Clearly time spent alone with the Father was critical to Jesus' ministry. And when he prayed, things happened. If we hope to model our lives after his, to become more like him, then we need to be consistently in prayer to our Father in heaven, much the same as he did. Now obviously we can't run to the top of a mountain every day to pray or jump in a hot tub or lock ourselves in the bedroom. But my experience tells me it's critical that we find some way to make it happen, however that might look to each of us. And I realize too that how we pray can also be different for each of us. I think sometimes we think our prayers have to be long and elaborate and flowery, using big words and such. But this is our time alone with God, just that time alone, one-on-one. He's not worried about the words we use. Worrying about how we present our prayers to him shouldn't be a stumbling block to spending time in prayer. In Romans chapter eight, Paul teaches us that the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. He says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's will. And Jesus teaches us that God knows our needs. So we don't need elaborate prayers. In Matthew chapter 6, we continue to read, When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered by merely repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. So be encouraged in the thought that God isn't worried about the exact words we use when we pray. But if you should find yourself at a loss as to where to start, if you have a time where the words just aren't coming, you can follow, again, what Jesus taught. When the disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, he gave them this prayer. And he said, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we know this. We usually refer to it as the Lord's Prayer or some people refer to it as the Disciples' Prayer since Jesus gave it to the disciples. New King James Version captions it as the model prayer. There are three petitions there that are directed towards God, upward towards God, and three that are directed towards our needs to God. Jesus says, pray like this. We can model our prayers after this. It gives us a starting place. Direct your prayers to honoring and respecting God. The three other petitions are asking you, asking for your needs or the needs of others. Again, our prayers don't need to be overly complicated. Jesus says, Your Father in heaven knows your needs before you pray them. And that's good because 
I've got to admit that sometimes as I pray, I get pretty overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of prayer requests I have before me. And the needs can be overwhelming, and if I'm not careful, I can find myself just bringing a long list of prayers to God without honoring and acknowledging just how great a God I serve. I'm praying to develop my relationship with the Lord as well as bringing needs to him. And I have to remind myself sometimes that he's not a vending machine where I just stick my prayers in and hope answers come out. Honestly, some mornings I find myself just praying, God, how great you must be, how great you are that my one small voice this morning, you hear it. You're, you're here with me in the midst of there's got to be thousands if not millions of other people that are praying at the same exact moment. And yet, God, you hear my one small voice. So as I begin to pray, I do my best to start in praise and worship to him and acknowledge him as the giver of all things. And it's important that we're consistent in our prayer life too. As I said earlier, Jesus was in constant communication with his Father in heaven. His entire life was spent in prayer. In Luke 5.16, we read that Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness to pray. He prayed all the time. Even as he hung on the cross, he was still praying. He prayed for his tormentors when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And as he took his last breaths, he prayed, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 tells us that we should continue steadfastly in prayer. And again in 1 Thessalonians, he tells us, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul says to pray without ceasing. It's our, if our hope is for our relationship with our Father in heaven to continue to grow and develop, then we need to recognize the need for us to be in constant communication with him. My friends, we are incredibly connected in the world we live in today. We've, our phones, our devices, they give us the ability to stay connected to virtually everything going on in the world we live in. We have contacts for everything right at our fingertips. My encouragement to you this morning is this. Through Jesus, we are incredibly connected to God. We have the ability to be in immediate contact with him through prayer. We can come to the throne of God at any moment in any place. All we need to do is reach out to him in prayer. In Hebrews chapter four we read, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As I finish, let me say this. I am still very much a work in progress in the hands of the Lord. My private prayer life, it still remains one of my biggest challenges. It's something I've found has to be a discipline in my life. It goes hand in hand with my study of God's word. Those two disciplines together have helped my relationship with God grow far beyond where it was back in 2017. My prayer for you is that you can find the same growth in him. I encourage you, devote yourself to the study of God's word. Devote yourself to a private, personal prayer life with the Lord. I think you'll be surprised where God might lead you if you do that. And finally, I'll leave you with one, my, with one of my favorite verses. It's from James. He says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Thank you. Let's go to prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for giving me the opportunity to be up here and speak this morning. I pray, God, that my words have spoken to someone in this room. And Lord, as we come to you, uh, I pray that um, we will seek you out in a much deeper, more diligent and, and disciplined way, God. I know, God, that I confess that I am still weak at times, 
but Lord, I, I just want to do what is pleasing in your sight. I wanna seek your will in all that I do. I pray that we all are that way, Lord. So we thank you again for the time that you've given me this morning. I thank you just for how you've changed my life, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Thank you.